winter time I tell myself that I'm so lucky to be loving you So lucky to be the one you run to see In the evening when the day is through I only know Generally, my early memories musically of growing up, my family, listening to music, surrounded by music, lots of records, lots of uh, um, uh, television, big variety shows that were on all the time, Sid Caesar's show, Carol Burnett's show, well that was a little later on, uh, Gary Moore's show, Ed Sullivan show, all those people. And in my family, the music shows were top notch. Those were the, uh, that's where I learned to love Gershwin songs and Irving Berlin songs and, and uh, singers like Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby and Louis Armstrong and all of those people who populated those shows. My family, uh, none of them were professional music makers at all, but they were people who loved to listen to music. And so I was surrounded by it. And uh, I just liked to sing. Uh, I learned to like to sing when I was a little kid. I didn't care for singing too much because um, I remember in classrooms when all the kids are singing, I was the only boy in the class who could carry a tune. And the other boys sort of resented me for it, you know, traitor. Uh, but I didn't know how to not carry a tune. Uh, I wish I could do that now. Uh, it was just... Um, uh, an ability to sing, I guess, and so I learned to be more interested in singing because I could do it. And uh, and from then on, I guess, I just kept my ears open. I had no musical education whatsoever. I, um, no, actually, when I was in fifth grade, I took a, uh, I, I, my dad bought me a trumpet and I took in lessons in school. Every Thursday, Mr. Evenson would come to our classroom. He probably went to all the different schools. He came to my school, Calhoun School, on the Lake and Girard in Minneapolis, and gave us uh, band lessons. And that really was my only formal musical education. Um, when my family moved and I went to a different school, junior high school, Anthony Junior High School, the band leader there recognized that I didn't know how to read music, that I'd been faking it just by ear, and uh, he made it a little tougher on me, and I quit, um, which is, I wish I hadn't done that now, but uh, and they know, I never had any singing lessons or choir, I didn't take, I, I never took music again after that, all through high school, I had no, I was never in a high school choir or a band ever again, I just, uh, didn't want to do it in school anymore, to my detriment. Um, so uh, everything else that I do or that I play poorly um, is just uh, self-taught, I guess. Or maybe somebody showed me a few chords. Uh, when I first got into the batch, I was a lead singer in the band, and as the band evolved, and the, the principal songwriters of the band started singing more of their own songs. Uh, so, so what am I supposed to do? They said, well, you're going to be the piano player. I don't know how. Well, get a piano and you'll figure it out. And so uh, I, I got a little Wurlitzer classic um, uh, electric piano. And yeah, I figured out some chords and uh, pumping away at it. So that's, and I'm so glad that I did that because it's been a valuable tool. I'm, I'm not a you know, very good player by any stretch of the imagination, um, but uh, I use it for writing. It helps me to create music, uh, and uh, as long as I don't have to play it in front of people. Uh, so that was a, a, a good thing. First time I ever did anything professionally, I guess it depends on your definition of uh, what professional means, you know. Uh, um, that somebody, you know, gave me a couple of bucks, I suppose. Uh, I was in a band in 11th grade called the Griffins. I didn't come up with the name. I'm not even sure what it means. But somebody came up with the name the Griffins. 
and I was asked to join. And uh, we played, uh, I can't remember now if it's a VFW or a Scout, like, or a YMCA facility, but it was on like 35th or 36th and Nicollet Avenue in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, I think the building's still there, I'm not sure. And we played there. Uh, and this is, would have been in 1966. And I think they gave us a couple of bucks. So I would imagine that that's the first time I did anything professional. I, I really um, think of myself as turning professional in 1968, because the, the very first time I was ever in a recording studio to perform was 1968. And, uh, and then later I did a session for uh, the guys whose band I would later join. And the producer gave me five bucks for, for singing backup. So, wow. Every one of those dollars I earned singing, all five of them. So I thought, that's, you know, I'm a pro. And after that, it wasn't too long before we were working and, and started to earn you know, more decent money and became a, a viable band. And that was the band that became The Batch. Uh, what kind of a band was Batch and how did it prepare you for your career, it says here. Uh, well, I'll tell you. Uh, I have a high school diploma, Washburn High, class of 67. I have a uh, Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Minnesota. Outside of actually having them and, you know, okay, I did that. I don't know that I ever benefited in life from having them, but the batch, that was college. That was, that was the real institute of higher learning for me. That was college. That was school. That group. Uh, I learned how to be a professional musician and singer uh, through not only through the group itself, but through the associations of people I met um, through that group. Uh, that group is the reason I got into the recording business. Um, it was a good band. I mean, just want to know what kind of band it was. It was a good group. Uh, had the benefit of very, very wonderful songwriters within the group. And uh, Barry Thomas Goldberg and Gary Pollock were and are their names. And they, uh, uh, and they're good singers. Jay Lee, our bass player, with Lane, Gary Lane, our drummer, and it was a real brotherhood. It was a good group, and you know we had all the little infights that bands have, and all the great moments of togetherness. And you know it's the same five people for seven, eight years, and uh, and I just it was a real learning experience for me. And the band, I suppose you'd sort of describe it musically as a kind of a Beatles out of. Uh, Buffalo Springfield out of, uh, I don't know how to describe it more than that. Um, if we were playing a, a dance, we had a, a certain amount of cover tunes that we did. Uh, and if we were playing a concert, we would do all originals. We were able to do that. And uh, so it was, a, a, I cannot overestimate the influence that that group had on me in my life, professional life, and uh, just uh, growing up. They helped me to grow up. That band. The same, the commercial jingle? Yep. Work? Okay. Did what? any of the previous ones get destroyed? Was no. Okay. One, two, three. Commercial jingles. Um, describe the process. Uh, it's really, uh, it was a, a fascinating process. It was a golden age, I think, for uh, commercial production in uh, the Twin Cities. Dale Metton is the guy who got me into it. A wonderful producer, writer, performer. Um, uh, pretty famous, I think, in, in the Twin Cities. And a uh, significant music maker. And he started doing jingles, and, and he got us into uh, singing on them. And uh, long about 1969, I can't remember. I said that or not, but uh, I joined AFTRA, the you know, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. I thought, wow, I'm really coming up in the world. You know, I was 20 years old, whatever I was. 
And um, I'd always wanted to work in recording studios. I fantasized about recording studios. So this was just a perfect situation. And so I, I would go in there. They don't tell you what the, they call you for a session. They say, oh, we've got a session uh, tomorrow. Uh, come in at 1030. Okay. And you show up. They give you a piece of music. They maybe play it once or twice to run it down. And uh, I'm not a good sight singer, but I'm a good, I have good ear retention, I guess. I don't know what the term is. And so uh, uh, once I hear it once or twice, then with the help of what's on the printed page and the lyrics, of course, um, I never had any trouble. And I would do these sessions. And uh, for a certain period of time in particular, there were a lot of them. And uh, thanks to AFTRA, there was reuse and regional uh, upgrades and things. And I uh, yeah, put myself through college. Uh, it, um, and I'm still spending some of that money that I earned back uh, in the jingle days. Um, I didn't write any of them. You had asked me about um, if there was any writing involved uh, for several years. But uh, all along, about uh, after I'd been in it for about 10 years, I started gradually uh, getting projects of my own that involved uh, me creating them. And uh, so that uh, sort of lengthened the career in the studios for a, a number of years longer. And uh, when I was working for ad agencies later, one of my jobs uh, for uh, you know, these different uh, agencies, whether freelance or on staff, was to create music uh, for these clients and then uh, put the sessions together myself and uh, direct them and, and of course, uh, sing on them. most memorable commercials I did. I don't know memorable for who. Uh, one of them that, uh, that seems to be the most best remembered is one of the earliest ones, and that was for Embers. Remember the Embers? We're talking about in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Yeah, ran for 15 years, I think. Uh, old Home Foods. Uh, so come on, celebrate. Look up and let your spirit show. Old home and me. Um, Rick Lepart uh, put that one together. Um, I, those are the two that stand out because they ran the longest. Creative Lighting was one I wrote myself. Uh, ran for a long time. Creative Lighting. Da -da -dee -da -da. Uh, I really can't think of any more right now. Uh, but when I hear them, then instant recollection comes back. Like, a, you know, just triggers the memories of the session and I did uh, commercials for uh, Dr. Gama yogurt, and, and uh, I did over a thousand of them, and yet I can't remember specific ones right now. But they were sessions, film soundtracks, uh, and uh, industrial films for uh, John Deere and things like that. Just uh, Arctic Cat, on and on. Um, the work has really slacked off for me uh, I don't I, I know that the business has changed a lot the unions aren't as strong everybody has a studio in their basement um, and the music has changed those things have impacted the business when I started and for many many for you know, 25 years uh, it was the same kind of thing there were three or four big studios in town you go in and, and the it's a union contract and it was very, very wonderful. And uh, it's not quite the same anymore. It's a little harder um, to make a living at it around here. Uh, and, but it's easier to get into it because there is, because it's uh, the diaspora, if you want to call it that, of studio work. Um, it, you know, it's just so much more, uh, uh, there's so many different places to record. For instance, um, uh, um, you talk about people like Don Shelton of the High Lows or uh, uh, Bonnie Herman uh, and uh, people like that who ended up in Chicago. They recorded every day. Uh, one fellow whose last name was uh, Dick Noel. I got a chance to work with him and do some sessions with him. But they worked in Chicago every day. Well, we didn't work every day, but um, for a, a number of years, we worked maybe twice a week in sessions. 
uh, it just uh, it was it was wonderful. Nowadays, uh, how do you get your gigs? How are you compensated? I was doing session work for uh, 15, 20 years, uh, I don't know, whatever it was, and, and uh, thought highly of myself, let's put it that way, as a professional, because I knew how to go into a recording studio and make music. Uh, when jazz, pop music of that earlier era, great American songbook, let's call it, when that started to become popular again, I thought I should take a swing at this because uh, I grew up listening to this music and I kind of trained myself singing it. Uh, I had done some work with uh, Tom Lieberman uh, and Teron Bay on Prairie Home Companion uh, doing jazz tunes. And I, you know, I think I could make some inroads in nightclubs doing these songs uh, because there is a, you know, it's popular once again. And so I began to try to get some work. And uh, because of my session work and my radio work on MTR at the time, I uh, had some connections. I knew some people who got me into uh, various clubs. And, uh, audition more or less by sitting in. Any singer has to sit in at first. And in order to sit in, you have to let people know what you sound like because any sensible performer in a nightclub knows not to let any jerk sit in who they haven't heard yet. You know especially some middle-aged guy like me, which I was middle-aged at the time. Uh, uh, so I had people who sort of opened the door for me because they knew me from studio work. And I guess I sounded decently enough that I began to get gigs on my own. Um, uh, compensation, how you get compensation, you do the gig and then you get paid. Um, how you get any kind of reasonable comp compensation, you are at the mercy of number one, the club owner, and how reasonable they are about how much they're going to pay you. And number two, you're at the mercy of your own self-esteem and uh, what you're going to uh, put up with or what you're going to accept. Uh, and uh, uh, there are clubs who pay uh, reasonably. There are clubs that pay more than reasonably, and there are clubs that uh, beg, uh, beg off on that and uh, let you know that they can't afford to pay above a certain amount. And then you make a choice based on a, a number of factors, and, um, and we all do that uh, to one extent or another. I'm not going to work below this X amount anymore, or I'm not going to accept any new work below this amount, but I'll keep doing this earlier job for a variety of reasons, um, but keep that to a minimum. Um, and so there's so many different variables that, that involve that. It's down to uh, what's worth it to you and what you need to make in order to pay your accompanists and, and uh, you know make it worthwhile. You don't want to pay to play. Uh, starting in 2006, uh, I started doing a show on Jazz 88, uh, which is KBEM FM 88.5 in the Twin Cities. And it's called The Big Shift, The Bing Shift. And it's, uh, it's a little play on you know, swing shift. Um, and it's uh, just a, a, you know, I have to, just a little a backup to say that um, if you look at radio logs, um, in the newspapers from the 1930s into the 1940s into the 1950s, one of the things you become aware of is that just about every station or several stations in every market would have perhaps one or two blocks every day in their local programming where they played Bing Crosby records. 15 minutes to a half hour, maybe 45 minutes, uh, WLOL in the Twin Cities did that, WPBC in the Twin Cities did that, and uh, uh, you look into it a little further, one of the things you discover is that uh, a survey was taken uh, over the years uh, and uh, claimed that over half of the 80,000 hours devoted to local 
disc jockey airtime in America uh, throughout, uh, you know, in every, any given year, throughout those years, were devoted to the playing of Bing Crosby records, which is nearly half of all disc jockey airtime. People go, what? What are you talking about? And uh, unless you were around at the time, and precious few folks are anymore, um, you can't imagine how important he was to those generations. And uh, uh, what I do is I like to recreate that period of time when uh, this one singer's music uh, was worthy of study. He was the American singer. And he recorded every year consecutively for 51 years. I think it's an amazing statistic. And the music is so much fun to listen to because it encompasses so many different styles of music just this one singer down through the years. And so uh, the Bing Shift is not the first program I've done on Bing. I played his records on KLBB uh, for uh, about 15 years. Uh, and over the years, I've always managed to, whatever station I'm at, to get some of his music in. And so we've been doing this for uh, 13 years now uh, on Jazz 88. And uh, some of the shows are playing on, uh, so I'm very proud of this too, uh, of the Bing Cro official Bing Crosby website, which is bingcrosby.com, uh, which is um, organization, the Bing Crosby Archive. Uh, they govern that uh, uh, channel. My programs are on there too, not only the Bing Shift, but a, a wonderful series that we did originally for Sirius XM that I did uh, in association with uh, Bing Crosby Enterprises called Bing's Basement. And I co-wrote that and co-produced it with the, uh, the head of the um, uh, uh, Crosby Archive, a, a gentleman named uh, Robert S. Bader. And he and I uh, put together this series, which is still running now on uh, bingcrosby.com, Bing Crosby Internet Radio. So I'm very proud of that and uh, uh, very honored that I get to be a voice on that, uh, on Bing's own channel. It's, uh, you know, I feel a, a little sense of accomplishment uh, at that. Uh, it's uh, uh, something that beyond that is indescribable for me. It gives me great pleasure. Um, I, he's not only my favorite singer and someone who's influenced me and every other singer uh, in the last half century in, in the jazz field, whether they know it or not, uh, but uh, he's my hobby. And you know, what's more fun than indulging your hobby? You know, I collect his records, and films and, and books about him and magazines and things like that. And to be able to take one's hobby of passion, so to speak, and indulge it every week in a radio program, well, that's kind of fun. So uh, that, that's how that came about. And that's uh, been one of the mainstays of my radio career, which is you know, getting close to 45 years now. is to play those records. Well, I just hit 70 years old, uh, which I think is kind of fun. Um, I don't, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> what I can't explain is the fact that it actually, I'm sort of happy about it in a way. I don't know. Being 68 or 69, that's sort of boring. And 70 is kind of like, yeah, I don't have to take any guff from anybody anymore. Clean that up. And um, it's, a, it's a good feeling to, to kind of look back and say, well, she did some good things. And I love the fact that I still get to do some of them. Uh, performing often these days, writing shows and I love performing at the, the Dunsmore Room, the Crooners, for instance. Uh, that, that's a, a wonderful venue that so many performers are, are really enjoying the benefits of these days. And uh, it, it's wonderful to still be on the radio and to still be recording. Uh, I have a, a wonderful uh, friend and business partner in Nancy Harms, whose career uh, has been uh, uh, one that I've been closely uh, involved with both in terms of recording and, uh, and uh, 
managerial, a personal manager, and all that sort of thing. Uh, uh, she's a magnificent artist, and one whom I'm very proud of because uh, she's just exponentially blossomed into uh, a, a, an amazing soul and an incredible performer. And most of my recording activities these days have to do with uh, uh, less so myself as a performer, although I have an album that I, I'm definitely going to be making uh, this year. Uh, but um, right now, most of the concentration is on uh, her upcoming work. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's extremely creative, and it's just a delight to uh, spend so much of my professional life now working with her. Um, and so many other great musicians that, I, that are... Uh, uh, there are times in a gig, in the middle of a gig, whether I'm working wherever it is, um, with a trio, for instance, where you just stop mentally. You don't stop in the middle of the performance because people will wonder if you're, you know, crazy. But uh, you take a moment for yourself in the middle of an instrumental or whatever, and you think, I'm a lucky guy to be able to make music with these incredibly skilled people. Uh, it, it just, uh, you know, how did I get here? I'm still not sure. Uh, it's a fortuitous bunch of circumstances, meeting the right people at the right time. And, and uh, there's a lot of negativity too. There's a lot of pounding the floor with your fists and frustration because things aren't going right. And uh, I want out. I don't ever want to deal with this again. You know, at those kinds of, you know, it's not all gravy. It's a difficult business, and your ego is regularly smashed into a million pieces on the hardwood floor because uh, because it's a hurtful business. Um, I'm at a time where for the for maybe because that 70 mark where it's like, well, I made my point, and uh, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. And if people want me, they know where to find me. And uh, I'll just kind of keep it that way. And uh, if uh, they stop wanting me, then I'll sit in a room and I'll play records and, and I'll archive the stuff I did. That'll take me till I fall over. <laughs>
as the saying goes, I have no idea where I would be. And I'm sure there'll be dozens of others that I'll think of and I'll kick myself for not uh, acknowledging them. But, uh, I love them all. Thank you to all those people.